Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Streaming Alchemy Show. I'm John Mahoney, and on today's show, we're going to be talking about working with remote guests in your productions. This is something that's been increasingly popular in live streaming circles. A lot of producers are not only bringing in remote guests for different types of discussions, very specific topic, deep dives, or even panels with multiple people, but they're also running shows that have remote co-hosts, so you can have multiple hosts on a show. So this is something where we really want to talk a bit about best practices and sort of the preparations you'll need to do to be successful with working with remote guests. But before we get into today's show, as we always do, we want to remind you that we will be taking video call in today. Uh, so if you'd like to join the show, ask us questions on air, talk about your own experiences, either being a guest on a production remotely or uh, trying to bring in remote guests into your productions, we'd love to hear from you. And of course, also, anything you want to share in the comments would be great. So please join in. We love the engagement here. So let's get started. One of the things that our sponsor company, NeuralNet, does is produce technology that allows remote guests to join productions. So because you've had experience with this, uh, we've learned a lot of lessons over the years about best practices for making this work. Some of these will probably be on the more obvious side. Others may be things that you never would have thought of. And some of them are just good guidelines to work with. So I'm going to break this up into three different sections. One is sort of the foundational technical things you should just make sure you have set in order to do remote guest productions. And then we're going to start to talk some more about the physical environment that you want the guests to be operating in. And then talk more about from the production side, some of the things you should be doing to make sure that your remote guest based shows go off pretty smoothly without any unexpected or difficult to solve hiccups as you go along. So let's get started looking at what will be happening on the technical side to do these types of productions. So the first thing, and probably one of the key things, is to have your remote participants use technology that's at least somewhat new. Uh, it should be something within the last four years or so. Uh, anything that gets older then starts to run the risk of not being powerful enough to deal with everything that a remote guest system will need to handle. So, I mean, the first thing you're going to need to deal with is you're going to be sending video out. So it needs to be able to capture, encode, and stream that video out but you're also going to be sending video back to these guests. So it needs simultaneously to be able to take that video in and render it at a high enough resolution for the remote guest so they can feel engaged and fully participating with what's going on in the show. One of the things that we have found is that sometimes, for most people, they have newer uh, phones and newer tablets. So even if their computer is old, their phone may be fairly recent. And the quality of signal you can get out of a phone today is surprisingly good. The key here, though, is for the phone, you have to make sure you're not hooked up to cellular, but that you're hooked up to a local hotspot, something that they can connect to with Wi-Fi. So that will make a big difference in terms of quality if the guest has a poor uh, main computer to work with. So something to keep in mind is it's sort of a A plan and B plan in here, but having a, a sufficiently powerful system on the other end is really important. Sort of hand in hand with that is if they are using a computer, they need to shut off all the other things that could be going on on that computer. And there's a, a number of reasons why. First, if you're dealing with a computer that isn't super high end, you may need all the cycles, the processing cycles that computer has to handle the uh, remote guest stream. 
if there's other things running on that system, that's sucking those resources away from what you need them to be doing. The other thing is that it becomes distracting for people. If they have email alerts popping up on their system or other types of notifications coming in, that's going to take their attention away from engaging with you and sort of by proxy dealing, engaging with your audience. And that engagement is really key, whether it's the way you engage with an audience or the way you have your guest engage with you and the audience. Having that sort of full focus, you are my most important thing at this point in time is, is critical to, to doing a good solid production and making your guests look professional. So having all these other distracting things, resource consuming things, they should be removed from the system. The other thing, though, is anything that could be pulling resources from the internet connection that guests will have, those things should definitely be shut down, even if they're running in the background. This could be anything from downloading music or movies to uh, things that could be you know, going on where they're, they're doing prints or they're transferring files or other stuff. This doesn't just relate, in that case, to your guest computer, but to any computer on the guest network that could be sharing that bandwidth. So this is something where the guest will have to solicit that type of cooperation to make sure that nothing that can take away bandwidth is going on, even if it's outside of what they have going on on their system. So this is one of those things, using an external webcam. You can't always do it. Sometimes guests just don't have any other option but to use their built-in webcam. But wherever possible, using an external webcam would be a better choice. Uh, it can be any type of you know, external camera. So it could be a camera that they're bringing in through NDI if they have a higher-end system. It can be something where they maybe prop up their phone and use that as an NDI stream into their uh, main computer that they're connecting to you from and use that as a camera. There are different ways you can get an external camera, but you will definitely get better imagery in almost all situations uh, from using an external webcam. The other thing, and this applies to any camera you're using in a professional space, if there is a way turn the automatic settings off for that. What you don't want is for when somebody is actually like moving in or moving out or sort of engaged with this where the focus starts to hunt on the, on the webcam or the a cloud passes overhead and suddenly the you know, iris opens up and you get this sort of blown out look for things and then it shrinks back and it becomes more balanced. When you get it set, Try to turn everything auto on that camera off if possible. Again, these are not things that you necessarily can do, but if you can, I'd highly recommend that you really focus on you know, getting those things taken care of. The other piece, and I'll put these two together, it's use an external microphone and use headphones. One thing I can say more than anything, is that the quality of the audio is really going to define the overall quality of that guest participation in your show. So anytime the audio is tinny or hard to understand or just like boomy, doesn't have you know, clear articulated sounds in it, hearing and understanding what that guest says can be very, very difficult. So having an external microphone will typically raise the quality of the audio for the guest. And we've mentioned it multiple times, people will tolerate poor video before they'll tolerate poor audio. And so getting that audio solid is important. And a part of that also is having the guest use headphones. If you have a good microphone, it will pick up things that are going on around it uh, pretty clearly. And so if the guest is listening through speakers on their laptop or speakers on their computer, that can cause echo back both to the studio audience but also to the guest because when they're talking, the mic will pick up their audio 
and it can loop back when it when you're sending you know when they're hearing themselves in the uh, in the conversation. The other thing is uh, you will have uh, you'll have cases where the you'll get feedback, actual solid, you know, not quite Jimi Hendrix feedback, but feedback that will be distracting and disturbing to anybody that's listening to the show. And, you know, these things become more critical if you have multiple remote guests, where, you know, the speaking of one guest will be picked up by another and they won't have a clear signal because they'll hear things coming in out of time. So these things are important when you have just one guest, but they really become more critical if you're going to have multiple guests, anything where you do sort of panel type discussions or multiple co-hosts, those types of situations. Big difference with uh, having those two things set. So something we talked about in the first point was making sure you have enough bandwidth uh, to the internet in order to have a good stream. And one of the keys to that is plugging in with a hard wire into the internet. Sometimes you can't do this, but any time it's possible to do this, get your guests to do it. it. It really will make a major difference in the quality and stability of the signal that you'll be getting from these guests. Because even if you know, Wi-Fi looks good, it still has a lot more variables in it, other types of interference that can be going on in the open airwaves. So overall, the wire connection will, will just guarantee a more consistent video stream from your remote guests. And the last thing, and this is one of those, those things where we've learned it sort of through, uh, through painful experience. If your guest is using a battery powered device to connect to you, have them plug it in. We've been in several uh, situations where the remote guest was on their laptop and it just ran out of juice and died. These are the types of things where sometimes the person thinks, yeah, I can run this thing for a couple of hours, I'm fine. But what they weren't counting on is the screen being on all the time, continuous streaming, continuous receipt of video, all these things draw a battery faster. So even if your guest says, no, I've done these types of things before, it's fine. If it's possible, get them to plug it in. It'll make a big difference uh, in those outlier cases, you know, where you just don't want something bad like that to happen. So the next thing I want to talk about is, as we go through this is the physical setup that you'd like to have your guest be in with all of their gear and the environment around them. Because I think these types of things are really the next level in your production that you know, will we'll signal the professionalism, not just of your guests, but also of you for, you know, having them on your show. So the first thing is you want to raise, to have the guest raise their camera or webcam up to eye level. One of the key things when you look at any type of professional video is that you want to make eye contact with your audience. You want to be engaged with your viewers. And key to that is having that sort of eye level look right into the camera. So at one level, you know, you, you can have guests that even if they have the camera at eye level, they could be looking down all the time. So they're, they're sort of talking down here, looking at you on the screen as opposed to looking at the webcam. So in addition to having that camera at eye level, you also want to get your guests to look at, look at the camera directly as opposed to looking at the screen. And I know this is something that I struggle with too. So it's not something that's native or intuitive for most people, but it's something that with a little bit of coaching, you can get them, you can get them to do it at least at, at a very frequent basis. And uh, you know, it'll make their appearance on your show a lot more professional looking. But there are other reasons for this as well. First, the, for most people, when they have that camera on the laptop sort of coming up at them, you end up having a very unflattering sort of up-the-nose shot or sort of like the, the chin-level shot that doesn't flatter people. But in addition, 
the background behind the person becomes distorted based on the angle. So when you have a camera that's coming level at somebody, the walls and the ceiling, all that stuff looks very square and parallel and comfortable, normal to the viewer. When you're at an angle though, those things start to look a little wonky. So they start to look like they're converging at some point uh, out. And that can be very disorienting. It, it isn't something where people will necessarily notice and say, ooh, that looks terrible, but they'll just not feel comfortable looking at that type of shot. So for a variety of reasons, getting that camera up to eye level is important. So if you look here, I mean, we have a couple of different ways you can do this. I mean, the first one is you can get, if you're using a laptop, get, they have laptop stands. This one is one we saw at, at, at a company called Next Stand. Uh, I believe they were a European company. But this one folds up into a little pouch that you could slip in a backpack. So it's, you know, a thin tube that opens up in telescopes to do this. You can also get just a clamp which places the webcam higher up. So even if the guest doesn't have any way to elevate the laptop that they want to use, you can certainly, if they have an external webcam, elevate that. The other option is just take a stack of books, take three or four books and put the laptop on top of that. And that will certainly bring it into closer to eye level and give you a better shot overall for you know that remote guest. So in addition to uh, getting the camera at eye level, you want to make sure it's not being pointed at a window which is behind the guest. So there's a lot of times I've seen webcasts from people where they've got a bright window behind them and they end up looking like they're in the witness protection program or something. Their, their features are all <laughs> blurred out and dark and everything behind them is, uh, is bright. And this comes back to, again, if you can't get guests to lock in their cameras, the webcams are going to automatically try to compensate for the brightness of the light. So if somebody has a bright light behind them and the camera is looking at them, the iris is going to shrink so the bright light becomes normal, comes in a visible range. But in doing that, it's going to make the person become a silhouette or certainly dim and become hard to see any of their features. So this is you know, some basic stuff, but very important. And sometimes you have guests that have their desks with a window right behind it. So it's, it's very tempting for say, the guests to say, oh, I work here, I'm very comfortable here, I like to do it here. You've gotta make sure that that window light isn't shining in right behind the guest. So if there's anything you can do either to block it, close curtains, close blinds, or to sort of reorient the desk or have the person sit at a different angle so that light is no longer coming in behind them, that would be ideal. So when we talk about light, there's a couple of things. You want to make sure that the room the person in is sufficiently bright, uh, but you don't want to make it overly bright. You don't want to put on every light in the room or have very, very bright overhead lights with light coming into the guest because it's gonna make them look flat and washed out. So ideally the same basic lighting theory that you have in a studio would apply at home. So if you can get sort of the key and fill light types of models where I can have a brighter light off to one side and I can have a dimmer light or just something that would reflect the light off to another. Uh, sometimes you can actually have the guest use a computer as a light. So if you open up a computer monitor or even a laptop, if they had a second older laptop, they can then open up and just put a white screen on it, something that's mostly white and turn up the brightness or dim it. And now they would have a controllable light. This is something they could then use you know, with your guidance to try to dial in the best lighting image that they possibly can. So. Getting light right is important. And one of the things that I know for a lot of people, uh, they look best in natural light. If you have a room 
that's bright enough, that can bring in enough natural light, that would be great. And it really can give you the best, most flattering kind of light. But if the person is going to be on your show for any length of time, that light is going to change. So natural light changes throughout the day because the angle of the sun coming in is going to come in uh, differently and you know the how high that sun is above the horizon. So it'll be more diffuse or more bright at different times of the day. We've had cases where people started a show uh, and they looked great. And toward the end of the show, dust could hit. They didn't have any more light coming in. And they were sitting, again, almost like they were sitting in a dark room. They, they had no depth, very hard to discern their features. And this happened over the course of a show. So if you're going to use natural light, make sure that it will be consistent enough for the duration that the person's going to be on camera. Or make sure you supplement it with other lights that when that light dims, you'll still have a solid image coming from that remote guest. Something to consider for people that will be using natural light. So this is an interesting one because this was something that happened to us and it took us a while to figure out what was going on. You don't want to have a moving fan in a shot. The reason uh, we became aware of this was we had a guest that came on, we did testing with them, made sure everything was good, when they came back on the show, uh, their image quality was just a lot poorer. There's lower frame rate. It got a little blocky sometimes. All the things that you sort of associate with having a remote web-connected guest. And what it turns out is that they had a moving ceiling fan sitting at the top of their shot inside their uh, you know, it was their office room at the time. And that fan, because it's constantly moving, made inefficient encoding happen. It took a big block of the top of the ceiling and that constant motion needed to create new keyframes for all of those different motions, where that would be an area that would be easy to compress. Now, it required a lot more bandwidth and their image went down. When they shut the fan off and it became a static object in the set, in the, in the shot, their image quality improved. This is, we use the fan as an example, but anything that takes up a space, a visual space in the shot that is going to continuously move and change is going to suck up bandwidth. It's going to make encoding more challenging. So these are things to keep in mind when you help your remote guest compose a shot. Try to make sure that this shot has as, fewer, as few dynamic things as possible in it so that uh, you have a better quality picture coming out. So this is an obvious one, and I don't have any sort of explanatory <laughs> slide even first. Shut the things off in the room that make noise. So there are lots of people that will have things running which They've habituated to them. They don't even notice it. But you have a printer that comes on and starts to hum, and then it goes off. Or refrigerators in the room that do the same thing. Or uh, they'll have sounds that are playing, you know, alerts, alarms, other things that could be going on. Or they'll have roommates that are less than considerate <laughs> that they're on. So finding a way to shut off all the things that can make noise. Uh, just something to make sure that, to remind them to do. Uh, you don't have the ability to do certain things. Kids and pets, they, they have a mind of their own. So I think most people can be very forgiving of those things. But things that just show you didn't pay attention, those types of things, you know, that, that is something you really should take care of right from the beginning. And the other thing is declutter the background. Whatever you set up, you want to try to have a background that doesn't distract from the subject, from that guest, on their appearance. So if you look here, this is a deceiving shot. 
this is a very cluttered, messy environment this person is in. The only reason it doesn't jump out is because of the lighting. So the lighting keeps the focus on the person. That's the, you know, your remote guest in this case. But if this were more flatly lit, if you could see everything in this image so equally, all of this junk around this person would become distracting from anything that they were saying. So you want to make sure that people straighten things up. People don't have piles of junk in the back or toys or things disorganized or empty plates and cups. All these things just make the guest seem less professional, less credible. And it makes it just distracting for your audience when, they, when they're watching this guest. So definitely another thing that's fully in your control with your guest and something you should try to get them to do without, you know, without any sort of argument on that one. So the next section I want to talk about now is what you need to think about from the production side when you're bringing in remote guests. And probably the first and most important one is set up a time to connect with the guest in advance. You do not want to be trying to figure out an internet connection problem, a webcam not being compatible problem 15 minutes before a show. So you definitely need to connect with any remote guest you'll have at least a day in advance, and preferably at the same time that they're going to be appearing on your show to make sure that all the technical issues they could have are resolved. That would be everything from good sound, good video, anything you want to do with repositioning where the camera is, what the backdrop is for it, how lighting looks, all of those things. That day before is the time to take care of it. When you do a run-up to a show, and you've got a limited time to go live, you don't really have the cycles to focus on things that you could have taken care of in advance. And doing it at the same time as your show is actually important if it's possible. What you'll find is that sometimes people, if you connect with them during the day, things would work fine. But if you connect with them at night when all their neighbors are watching Netflix or streaming videos or doing online gaming. Suddenly that bandwidth, which seemed great at three in the afternoon, at seven doesn't look so great. And you need to make sure that you're aware of that and can adjust for that. Because you do have things you can adjust. You can turn down a guest resolution and make sure that, that pres you preserve it for frame rate. People notice the, the smoothness of motion more than the solid resolution of, of a person. So those types of things are in your control to work with, but you need to know about it in advance so you can handle it. The next thing is you're going to need to configure a mix minus audio for your guest if you don't have a system that generates that type of audio feed automatically. Now we've talked about mix minus in the past. And what a mix minus feed would be is it would be all the audio that's coming from your studio minus any of the audio that's coming from that remote guest. So when that remote guest is going to get something back for them to talk with you and to see the video that's going on, the audio they receive can't have their own voice in it because there's a delay in the process when you send that. When they talk and it gets into your studio and then you turn that around and send it back to them, you could be half a second, you know, 350 milliseconds, somewhere in there, and you'll get that slight echo, which will make it impossible for your guests to concentrate because every time they say something, that half a second later, they'll be hearing it back in the headset. So you need to create a mix minus for your guests and make sure that you know, they, they can understand everything that's going on and are comfortable with the audio that you're sending back to them. The other thing is when you talk to your guests for getting them set up technically, you also want to really establish the ground rules for whatever it is you want to talk about with them. 
So some of that could be things on their side. There may be certain subjects they don't want to talk about specifically. It could be new products that they haven't announced yet. It could be uh, subjects that are more sensitive for them and they'd rather just focus on one or two key things. You have to learn to work with them and respect what they want. And in return, there may be things that you want to make sure happen in the discussion. So you may turn around and not want things to be overtly commercial, where the guest sounds like they're shilling all the time. And you may want them to really talk about a higher end subject as opposed to a specific product they may be involved with. So those types of things, you really need to get that sorted out ahead of time. But what you don't want to do is you don't really want to create something that's all scripted. Scripted questions come across to almost everybody as stilted, prepared, and uninteresting. And that's the antithesis of everything that live is, where there should be an element of spontaneity and exploration and engagement. You, know, you don't want to defeat that by having this whole thing. Now, I'm going to ask you this question, and this will be your answer. That stuff just doesn't work, and it would be bad production, a bad production style to, to have that on when you work with guests. But making sure you do all of this ahead of time and understand, have a mutual understanding of what you want the discussion during the show to look like, that would be great. So the other thing that you're going to deal with is you're going to be sending them back, in addition to the audio, you're going to be sending them back video. Now, sometimes, like what we do here on this show, we have things like slides that will have text in them. You've got to make sure, which for anything you're sending back to that remote guest, that you avoid tiny text, small fonts. They're not going to be able to see it clearly. So if you are doing things where you call up a web page and that web page has all different fonts on it, don't expect that your guest is going to be able to read that just because you can. They will probably be looking at something at a lower resolution than you are on your screen. and you won't be able to get the type of engagement you want from them if you're asking them to comment on things that they can't clearly see. So this is just something from a production side, make sure what you send back uh, is, is large enough and comfortable enough for, for them to engage with it. And the other thing, I mean, that's general video practice. When you put anything out over video, you want to make sure that the fonts are legible when viewed on uh, you know, sort of a, a more compressed remote device. So the other thing, though, is when you actually want to connect for the show, connect at least 20 minutes in advance. This gives you time to sort out anything that may come up, to answer any questions, understand that the guest may be a little bit nervous before they go on, especially if they are not somebody that does this for a living that isn't used to appearing on camera. So make sure you have time to review everything with your guest, solve any last minute issues. You may find that when your guest is live, that they start talking louder and you may need to make adjustments to their audio. So things that you thought were set perfectly based on the conversation you had with them, may not work during the show, so you have to be adaptable with these types of things. But getting that connection to happen before the show with enough time to handle anything is important. It's just good prep workflow where you want to make sure that you're not at the last minute turning everything on and then surprised if something doesn't work exactly right. So that's one of those things that you just want to make sure that you are, you're aware of and do when you're working with remote people. Now, one of the things here, I want to show you a shot of a webcam. Now, this webcam is coming off a very high-end laptop. It's one of those low-in-the-bezel webcams. So this is the type of shot that you don't want to have happen with uh, your remote guest. It's it's hard to see the you know, person's face. You have that definite up-the-nose shot. You have a bright window behind the person. Uh, and the thing to keep in mind is this shot was coming in off a webcam on a i9, Intel i9-powered laptop 
32 gig of memory, a GTX 2070 graphics card in it. There was no processing issue with this system. This was simply the placement and quality of the webcam that was being used for bringing this guest on. Uh, the other thing is it, it, it didn't have any extra light added to it. Now, without changing anything else, we put on a light and used a high quality camera, same system, same session. We didn't even break and reconnect with the guest. This is just, we switched cameras mid-session and turned on a light. And this is the quality of the image we could get. Now, I'm not expecting that everybody that would want to bring on a guest could have the quality cameras and everything else that you know went into the shot, the lenses and lighting. But this is what is possible with a remote guest. So if you have somebody who may be a co-host who can invest a little more time, invest a little more money into having quality level lighting and video, you can remotely get great imagery coming into your production. So this is something I think for most people, when you see this as a contrast, everything else is the same. This is just a few components that were swapped out to make a huge difference in what actually comes across. And this is something that everybody uh, that's looking at this can take to heart. You can always get the image to be a little bit better. It's really just a question of where that investment makes sense for you and what you want. But even if you can't get it so you have you know, the shallow depth of field and everything else you have in the image here on the left, you at least can turn around and make all the different things with the composition of it, the lighting. Those are things that don't require a big budget and can be done pretty much with a, a small investment in a decent quality external webcam. And you know, of course, a microphone for audio. But these are things that use the same underlying technology, but with very different results. So I hope this was helpful to you. Uh, these, everything we've done here and outlined here really comes from experience in the field because we've seen a lot of different scenarios, a lot of different remote production environments. You can, you can start to sort of see what works and what doesn't, what's good practice and what's bad practice. A great example uh, of a production that's out on the web today, a current production, that is done using remote co-hosts is uh, Stephen Haywood and Telestream have a, web stream, a webcast called On Social, which is on on Thursdays. Stephen is local but all of the other co-hosts that he has on with them are typically remote. And they actually work together as a panel when they discuss technical production issues around uh, Telestream Wirecast. And it feels like they are together in one studio. It's seamless. The quality video is great. And it's something that if you look at it, you start to understand the potential that these remote technologies can give you as a producer, as somebody who's looking to create live streaming content. So it's something to keep in mind. Check that out if you can. Uh, definitely, worth, definitely worth a look to see what's possible when everything is put together in an optimal way. So that's it for today. What I want to remind everybody is that next week, we're going to be doing uh, the Stream Geek Summit. Uh, and we're actually going to, for our show next week, we're going to be doing a live update from the Stream Geek Summit. So it won't be a long show. I'll probably try to get on if we can get the bandwidth. That's always an issue when you're in a venue. But if I can get the bandwidth and we can, can get on air, uh, I'll give everyone a quick update, let everybody know what's going on, talk a bit about my workshop that will have happened. Uh, it's going to be at 9 a.m. on Friday morning. So uh, definitely, if you can make it out, that's even better. I'd love to see you in person. 
But if not, we'll be live streaming from the summit next Friday. So thank you, everybody. I definitely appreciate you making the time to spend with us here on the show. And have a great week. We'll see you next week. Take care.